This week, I had two options. I could talk about Star Wars, or I could talk about religion. And I just got to thinking about how seriously some people can take this stuff, and how heated things can get unnecessarily so, and just generally how personally people seem to take every single little thing. So I decided to talk about religion, of course. So if you've never been to America, one of the most fundamental aspects about our holidays is that many of them were heavily based in Christian customs, and then over the years we developed slightly different versions of them, which basically have nothing to do with Christianity at all. For instance, you can view Christmas as an extremely religious tradition based around the birth of Jesus Christ, or you can see it as an American tradition based around gift giving with the mascot of Santa Claus. You can see Thanksgiving as a way for Christians to thank God for all they've received that year, or as a celebration of the fairy tale that our country's history isn't founded in the bloodlust of genocidal rage. That one might be a little more severe than most of them. But my general point is that for every holiday or tradition, there's usually a version that's all about God and loving God, and a version that's apolitical, non-controversial, a-religious. As a proud American who knows a lot about my country's history and an atheist born and raised, I would love to stop this segment and tell you all about the United States Constitution and how the First Amendment guarantees not only freedom of religion, but freedom from religion, as Congress is not allowed to represent any religion over any other in the United States government. It would be a joy to suggest that it's this mantra of the separation between church and state, as well as our country's nature as a melting pot of all customs, which has caused us to develop these alternate versions of our customs, which are much more accepting. However, that's not really what the cause is. Because the real honest reason that our holidays have tended to develop like this is actually because of rampant consumerism. The reason that figures like Santa began to be associated with Christmas more than the actual church is that companies began marketing heavily during these times of the year to sell their products. Most Americans celebrate Christmas, Coca-Cola wants to advertise to most Americans, and so they choose to play to the elements of the holiday which have no real basis in faith. After all, if they were to put Jesus on a bottle, smiling and holding a Coke, it's likely that a lot of people would be offended, not gratified. Let's be honest with ourselves here. In modern America, companies have the power to make changes to our customs and how our holidays are understood because commercialism has a much greater grip on our lives than religion does. Don't believe me? What do you think is going to have a bigger worldwide impact in April 2019? Easter? or Avengers Endgame. The reason I'm bringing all this up is to highlight the bizarreness of Easter in modern America. Easter is a very important holiday for Christians, as it literally celebrates their God coming back to life. If you're not religious, Easter shouldn't matter to you. It has no purpose or significance outside of these very strict guidelines. And yet, like Christmas, our vision of the holiday is most greatly inspired by how companies advertise it to us. This whole notion of the Easter Bunny trying to deliver painted eggs to children it's so very strange, but so very widespread. My favorite thing to do around this time of the year is to go to all the markets to see what kind of non-religious Easter stuff they're selling, and it's always so weird. This year I noticed a big focus on Easter trees, which is the most totally depressing representation of how this holiday is just Christmas traditions lazily copied to the spring. I also found these texting Easter bunnies. I know the rule of three dictates that I should have another example for the sake of comedy, but honestly, how could I possibly top this? I made the last supper out of peeps. This holiday is milk toast and meaningless. Or maybe it's not. Maybe I'm just projecting. Either way, the numerous ways that companies have tried over the years to make Easter movies based around our modern customs is so fascinating to me. So in this video, we're gonna stop and review some weird Easter movies. So here we go. So a few months back, I did a Christmas video overanalyzing the various stop-motion holiday specials produced by Rankin Bass Productions, and mainly the Easter eggs included in all the films, which seem to suggest they all share one universe. In that video, I briefly touched upon the movie Here Comes Peter Cottontail, 
which was always one of the strangest of the bunch, at least in my opinion. The film surrounds a rabbit who is selected to be the chief Easter Bunny, only to then be forced into a competition with the evil Iron Tail over who will truly become the one Easter Bunny. Iron Tail plays unfair and tricks Peter into sleeping in, and he wins the competition because of this. Now living in a dystopian future where the bad guys won and everything is terrible, Peter seeks to right his wrongs by using convoluted time travel to defeat the bad guy retroactively. Which also happens to be what I imagine the plot of Avengers Endgame is going to turn out to be. As I said, Peter Cottontail is strange, but it was only when I started seeing it pop up a lot around the season that it occurred to me that it's also one of the best Easter films ever made. Like most Rankin Bass material, it's super charming in how it's animated and put together. And even if the story is a little too strange to follow, even as an adult, it's still a really awesome watch that definitely leaves an impact on the viewer. This, however, isn't the movie that I'm going to be reviewing right now. You see, at the turn of the new millennia, when a new generation of creators were taking over the industry, often greatly inspired by nostalgia felt for entertainment they had seen growing up, a trend started to appear of new films playing homage to the Rankin Bass era through reboots and sequels. Some of the most notable examples include Cartoon Network's The Legend of Frosty the Snowman, ABC's A Miser Brothers Christmas, and of course, Rudolph the Red-Nosed Reindeer and the Island of Misfit Toys. Also, incidentally, The Nightmare Before Christmas, but I try not to count that film in these lists because it's actually good. Alongside those films was another, as Sony apparently decided to make a 3D animated sequel to the original Peter Cotton Tale in 2005. It is not great. I want the cover of the original to sink in. Taken how much it pops, how friendly this character and indeed this movie looks. Just generally taken how pleasing this art is. Okay, now here's the DVD cover to the sequel. <coughs> is it an understatement to say that this film is ugly? I would argue, yes. The overconfidence of people making 3D animated movies in the early 2000s is astounding. It's actually rather shocking how the stop motion movies made decades before this actually still hold up in some ways, but modern animated films, which are barely 10 years old, do not in the slightest. I had this DVD in my house for a few weeks before recording this one, and no matter where I put this thing, I couldn't escape the feeling that it was always watching me. Imagine waking up one night and just seeing this lurking over your bed. Okay, so taking a quick detour, I posted on Twitter and Reddit that I was looking for suggestions for this one, and pretty much every movie I'm going to talk about today comes from you guys. And I'm so grateful that I'm going to try and give back to the community by showing everyone who suggested whatever I'm covering. All of these people mention the movie, directly or indirectly, but the first person who I actually saw who convinced me to look into it was at HipTurnip on Twitter. So a very special shout out to him. I'm planning on doing this a lot in the future, so if you want to get in on this experience and have, be featured in my videos in some way, then you should follow me on Twitter and uh, check out my Reddit as well. Here Comes Peter Cottontail the movie is set a few years after the original Here Comes Peter Cottontail, and features Peter trying to coach his son into eventually becoming the chief Easter Bunny, but young Junior would rather seek out his passions rather than following in the footprints of his father. There's more than one movie we're going to watch today that has this plot, and that's because it's pretty much the most predictable story that you could possibly do with a holiday mascot. But little does everyone know that behind the scenes, Iron Tail has returned and wants revenge. When Iron Tail breaks the clock that triggers spring and freezes time for good, Junior sets out to right his wrongs and save Easter on his own. I would argue that the worst thing in this film is not actually the taxidermied bunnies, with their gaping eyes that actively scream for a humane execution, but the character named Jacqueline Frost, who is apparently the replacement for a retired Jack Frost who wants to stop the changing of the seasons so she can keep at her job all year. She's honestly so bizarrely sexualized. Her facial animations are so glitchy and she keeps getting close-ups throughout the whole thing. Nothing about her makes me comfortable. Her body is disturbing like a doll at a nerd shop that you regret looking at. Her face is like that of a Jimmy Neutron background character. Her bootleg Elsa aura massively cripples the enjoyment anyone can take from any scene she's in. She bad. So all the bad guys in the movie try to steal parts from all the clocks in the various seasons so they can make it winter forever and they can rule the universe. I guess in this film every season has its own place on a map so they can physically walk from spring to summer and all that. It's the kind of logic meant to be understood by a toddler and no one else. But lo and behold, Peter Cottontail Jr. and his friends, who are collectively worth no analysis whatsoever, show up, and Jr. steals a part of the clock that makes winter happen, systematically meaning that time isn't running on any function whatsoever, and the universe is going to be destroyed if this isn't fixed. Jr. then uses this as a bargaining chip to get the rest of the clock pieces back, but negotiations are stiff to say the least. 
This is until Iron Tail and Frost fall over a cliff and the heroes manage to save the pieces at the last minute, saving Easter once and for all. Here comes Peter Cottontail, hopping and down the bunny trail, hippity hoppity Easter's on its way. What's your, your diagnosis on that one? It's bad. It's really, it's not good. But it's not. Wait. Oh, you better but. Here comes Peter Cottontail, hopping down the bunny trail. Yep, hop, Easter's on its way. Yes. Yes. This is what I was looking for. This is art. I changed my mind. Seven out of ten, pretty good. Peter Cottontail, he killed two people. Peter Cottontail the movie is pointless. It has almost nothing to do with the original. It comes across like it was made to fill a quota, and much of it is either boring, predictable, or unwatchable. Despite this, there are a couple of scenes here and there that I didn't find too impossible to sit through. And there was even a subtle callback to Rudolph's shiny new year that made me jump a little. And all over, shockingly, this movie is probably the most charming thing we're going to be looking at today. Oh man, the old Peter Cottontail movie, it just didn't get it. They just didn't get it. This movie is... This is, movie gets it. I didn't know there was an it to get until there was this movie. So our second movie is suggested by one Aiden Nicholson, who didn't actually have a movie in mind, but simply stated, Always look through the Amazon Prime free with Prime movies. Goldmine of bizarre films. So I took that advice, and I sure found some shit. Honestly, Aiden, I think you might have changed my life forever. So imagine Home Alone meets Homeward Bound, but with the production value of Cool Cat Saves the Kids. This dog is one of the smartest animals on the planet. You think Zeusy's gonna be okay, Home Alone? Are you sold yet? Because trust me, it only gets better from here. The Dog Who Saved Easter is actually the fifth film in a long franchise of movies with similar titles. It all started with The Dog Who Saved Christmas in 2010, which at the time was seen as a knockoff of The Dog Named Christmas. That span off into The Dog Who Saved Christmas Vacation, The Dog Who Saved Halloween, The Dog Who Saved The Holidays, which is very inclusive, and of course, now this film. Honestly, at this point, why aren't we worshipping this dog? Because I think his rap sheet rivals that of any other spiritual leader without conflict. Bombine. Have you ever saved any major American holidays? Need to get on it. I have this deeply hidden fear that movies like this are exactly what I'm going to end up making in 10 years. YouTube will dry up, everyone will forget who I am, and I'll be left making these sorts of things to pay the bills. I mean, look, it's easy. Just rent like 20 dogs and a couple of cats, film them running around and standing close to each other, and then pay mildly recognizable actors to come in later and voice the characters over. Mario Lopez. Geronimo! The dog who saved Easter. I've been forced to start writing this recap as soon as I possibly could, because this is one of those movies where I'm absolutely sure that given a few weeks or a month, I would confidently let this one fade from my mind. It's bad, but it's not a scarring kind of bad. It's just the sort of thing you'd rather choose to never think about again after seeing it. The movie starts off with Zeus's oh-so-iconic owners preparing to go on a cruise before dropping him off at a doggy daycare for the week. The daycare is newly opened as the owner inherited this house from her grandmother and is just looking for something to do with it. The dogs get to talking and oh boy oh boy does this result in some incredible dialogue that's totally natural to this footage and not randomly generated weeks later. New friends! Looks like things are picking up. I never had so much fun in my life. <laughs> hey buddy, nice to meet you. Let's go say hi. Fun fact, dogs are all Muslim because everyone's Muslim until they're corrupted. That's it. I don't have What? <laughs> <laughs> But across town, there's another doggy daycare that's basically doggy prison. And the Cruella owner of that pound discovers that she's losing all of her regular customers to the cheaper, less prison-y pound that's just opened. So she hires a bunch of goons to break into the house and ruin the business somehow. These are all goons from the previous movies who have been stopped by Zeus before and thus rightly fear his might. Did she just say Zeus? Did you say Zeus? This dog is one of the smartest animals on the planet. The plans they orchestrate include calling a health inspector, then going in beforehand as fake health inspectors and telling her all of the things that she needs to fix, causing her to fix all the things that the real health inspector would object to. I think they're doing this so they can stake out the house where they find a safe, but later turns out that safe is empty, so just ignore that plot point. 
Next, they go in and try and plant fleas, but they accidentally give this guy fleas instead. Their final plan is to break in, steal all of the dogs, and just bring them to the other doggy daycare. I don't understand what this woman's plan is. The owners of these dogs didn't leave them at this daycare. Is she going to call them and ask for a ransom? Do you know what's occurring to me just now? That this might not be a good movie. <laughs> that. Also, the fact that I don't think this movie has anything to do with Easter. <laughs> what makes you think that? <laughs> when did you how are they saving what? Easter? <laughs> what part of this perfectly traditional Easter movie is maybe do you think that it's not even Easter related? There were Easter eggs, Clinton. This time, it's personal. <laughs> yeah, so Dean Kane used to be known for playing Superman on a show called Lois and Clark, and now he does movies like this often enough that his character has continuity between the films. I thought about making fun of him for this, but honestly, compared to what the cast of Smallville is up to these days, I think he's doing okay. The owner of this daycare goes on a date to an Easter egg hunt, and Zeus comes with them. I guess at some point during the sequence he saves Easter, because otherwise the holiday is never brought up in the film significantly again. The owner finds out what's happened, and runs off to the other doggy daycare to save the pups, but Zeus has already broken them free and runs to the first doggy daycare, only to find out that those goons have gotten inside the house and are trying to steal the safe. What are you gonna do? What else? I'm gonna save Easter. <laughs> there it is, it's an Easter movie now. <laughs> Officially an Easter movie. He's got a basket, Caleb. <laughs> oh, Caleb, this dog is psychotic. <laughs> Zeus then lays a long series of Easter-themed traps which base themselves not only in physical mechanisms, but also in deep psychological reasoning. He's able to figure out that the fat one will stop and eat all of the jelly beans he leaves out, so he sprinkles them all across the house to slow him down and then lead him to a basket where he's hidden a mouse trap. When the fat guy falls for that trap, he then sprinkles jelly beans all over the floor, which makes him trip and he passes out. I can't wait ten movies from now where he's basically saw. <laughs> The other goons find him and try to escape, but Zeus throws eggs at them because his actor is a good doggo who does neat tricks. And then they try and run out the door, but that was a big mistake, and Zeus triggers the chandelier to fall on them and they die. I live for the thrill of killing folk! <laughs> if I could go back to the force, I would in a minute! <laughs> Oh, and I somehow forgot to mention that throughout the whole movie, there are these fully omnipotent chicks that they keep cutting to, who I presume exist in a totally alternate plane of existence and view us like cattle. They just stand around and occasionally narrate what's happening in the movie to each other. This is shaping up to be quite a love story. Oh boy, how I would kill to have these guys in every film I see. Can you imagine them giving their two cents on all the scenes in episode 9? Because frankly, I think that's what the series has been missing. After we had finished the movie, Caleb and I were stuck in such a shock that we ended up watching all of the bonus features on the DVD. This included not only an eye-opening behind-the-scenes feature, a several-minute video that was just photos they took while making the movie over soft music, but also a trailer for a Brendan Fraser movie called Furry Vengeance. You can't escape. <laughs> The furry. <laughs> the Dog Who Saved Easter is a fascinatingly unfascinating exploration into the minds of filmmakers who desperately want to keep making movies despite not having any ideas, any funding, or anything at all really besides the goldmine of filming and dubbing over dogs. It's a movie made to tie into the holiday, but it has almost nothing to do with Easter at all. And yet, it clearly must work, because they keep doing it. I would sooner believe that this series has secretly been an elaborate drug front, than that there is actually an audience eagerly worshipping the six films in this series. It's bad. Really bad. Frustratingly bad. But now this film and I are bonded at the soul. I will die thinking about this film, and when the 7th, 8th, ninth, and 10th ones drop, I will be in the front row. Every single time. All right, you want to watch Hop now? No, thank you. Oh, Clinton. <laughs> There's a movie called Hop, and apparently a lot of you guys want to see me talk about it. Twelve years ago, 20th Century Fox released a little film titled Alvin and the Chipmunks. The animation looked bad on its own, and incorporating it into the live-action segments was sickening. The comedy was lowbrow, and the storyline's entirely forgettable. I would say that the movie ages poorly, but that would imply that it was actually good when it came out. 
The film was a shocking success, and this led to many attempts to copy this horrible, horrible gimmick over and over again. The most notable of these was probably the iconic Smurfs film series, but it's today's topic that is even more perplexing than that. Hop was made with a shocking budget of $63 million. For every two minutes that this movie goes on for, over a million dollars was spent. Taking that into consideration, I would argue that it looks extremely terrible. But the payoff to this fact is that the film ended up making almost three times that at the box office, failing to be a flop despite being openly reviled by audiences and critics alike, which truly boils the film down to its most basic inspiration and goal. The desire for a corporation to make money. Hop is a heartless, calculated attempt to make a massive amount of cash without actually caring in the slightest. It's a horse designed by committee, something with no merit outside of a massive amount of money. It's only positive is making the other films in the series look like Mozart by comparison. The film's pitch is that the old Easter Bunny is preparing for his son to take over his job, but the young junior isn't too excited that he's supposed to be perfect and he isn't, and he's also interested in his own passions, specifically drumming. So he runs away to Los Angeles where he tries to find a home. He runs into this guy, a homeless schmuck who is looking over a mansion and grew up fascinated by the Easter Bunny. They have adventures. I know that the standard for this show is me going over the plot bit by bit, but honestly, what is the point? Would you believe me if I told you that there are a triplet set of pink bunnies and that there's a joke where they go to the Playboy Mansion? How would you feel if I told you that there's a gag where the Easter Bunny shits jelly beans? Or that there's another scene where the main character's sister ends up eating from a pile of jelly bean shit without anyone telling her. Hop is one of those movies where it's both infuriating totally in every way, yet it's impossible to find a way to actively discuss it in a sincerely invested manner. I don't even know what to say about it. A part of me hopes that if I just fill this section up with words and put clips of the movie over me talking, you guys will be able to see what the movie looks like, and then you'll all sort of go, Oh, okay, I get it, it's bad. Do you want to hear about the scene where they're watching an Easter play and the adopted sister isn't good at singing, so the main character takes over the performance and they sing I Want Candy? He's got everything I desire. He's really good! The bunny is voiced by famous humanitarian Russell Brand. I imagine they convinced him to be in the film because if they didn't, they'd use a real bunny, and he thought that would be cruel. So he agreed to do it instead. There's a subplot in the world of the Easter Bunny where an evil Spanish chick, played by a guy known for making people feel uncomfortable, is trying to steal the scepter and make himself the new Easter Bunny. They kidnap the main character and bring him up to their world, which truly emphasizes how these two locations were not designed to mix in any way. Just look at that. It looks bad. It looks terrible. Awful. Horrible. Is this doing anything for you? While we were watching, Caleb and I began to try and figure out which world was worse, the human one or the Easter Bunny one. The conclusion we came to was whichever world most recently had had two or more characters talking was inevitably always going to be the worst one, because the writing is so terrible that anytime anyone talks, it somehow causes physical pain to the audience. The government should replace waterboarding with just showing our enemies this film. There's a scene where the Easter Bunny ruins this guy's job interview and where it wrecks the mansion he's staying at, which he's supposed to be keeping clean. These are both scenes that exist. They're bad scenes. Am I doing this right? Uh, there's also a scene where Russell Brand shits candy and lets the Big Bang Theory girl eat it. Did I mention that already? God damn, I'm crap. I'm so sorry. Sorry, this really isn't my A-game, is it? One day, aliens will find the remains of our civilization totally destroyed by an unseen force, almost nothing remaining. Then they'll discover this movie, sitting in the rubble. And then they'll go back in time and destroy our civilization, thus creating a convoluted predestination paradox which we will deserve. Hot bad, I have Patreon, video over.